finally given us an idea of where this happens along the eastern U.S. by using weather radar. Our colleague Nathan Rott talked to the lead researcher on the paper, a Princeton PhD student, Feng Yi Guo. The cool thing about this is that most of them are nocturnal migrants, meaning that they migrate at night, and they usually take off in a very synchronized way near sunset, which can be well captured by weather radars. So birds show up differently on weather radar than rain, for example. And it's those distinctions that help them map out where the birds are resting. I'm dying to know what were these secret places that the scientists <laughs> uncovered. So for spring migration, the researchers identified hotspots throughout the Midwest and the East. They're mainly in deciduous forest fragments, so like blocks of forest. And when you add up both spring and fall hotspots, the researchers found that only one third of those spots are in protected areas, like a state forest or a national park. Huh. Feng Yi says part of the reason for that is that a lot of this land is privately owned. So she hopes this kind of data can create opportunities to partner up with private landowners on bird conservation efforts. Fascinating. That is Emily yeah. Fong and Margaret Serino from NPR Science Podcast Shortwave, where you can learn about new discoveries, everyday mysteries, and the science behind the headlines. Good to have you both with us. Thanks again. Thanks, oh, sorry. Pleasure. You're listening to All Things Considered from NPR News. In Dallas today, more than 1,600 items of Hollywood history are up for auction. Everything from design sketches and prop swords to Arnold Schwarzenegger's leather jacket from Terminator 2. This huge assortment of movie memorabilia comes from the restaurant chain Planet Hollywood. Jerome Weeks of member station KERA takes a look at what's for sale. The Lion of Oost will do battle for us. The parting of the Red Sea in the 1965 film, The Ten Commandments, is an iconic special effects sequence. Sorry, As Moses, Charlton right now. Heston raises his wooden staff. Behold his mighty hand. Wait. Actually, that staff wasn't wood. It's sculpted Glass. fiberglass. And you can buy it. Yes, the actual oh. movie prop. It's one of the many costumes, San set Francisco. pieces, posters, and promotional items for sale online and on site here in Dallas through Sunday from Heritage Auctions. In their heyday, I'm each planet Hollywood to... had what amounted to a small movie museum uh, inside. Brian James is a senior director at Heritage. Right. He went through the Florida warehouses where planet Hollywood stored these things all for years. They, they I know the word gets bandied about too often, uh, but it is a once in a lifetime scenario because they were an institutional collector, so they had deep pockets so they could scour the it's earth to find traffic. the best of the best. Planet Hollywood started in 1991. Robert Earl, the restaurant chain's CEO, explained its basic appeal in an online interview with Heritage Auctions. Unless you were in LA or possibly uh, New York, you never saw the real still ahead. Uh, you didn't have an involvement in any extension of the movie for their lives. That and we afforded that. <clears throat> so, the restaurant chain wasn't about the food. It was about the possibility of meeting movie stars this or right now, just getting four, up close to something they wore six. on screen. The chain expanded aggressively in the 1990s. By 1999, Planet Hollywood had 80 locations worldwide. This it had resorts, traffic. stores, hotels, even a casino. Today. But its stock price that year was $1. The firm eventually filed for bankruptcy twice. Today, Planet I Hollywood know, moved down to a handful of hotels and restaurants. Show me how it is At the auction, you can bid on stunt rocks used in Braveheart or one of Indiana Jones' bullwhips. <laughs> or perhaps Red more to your taste, you can bid on one of Marilyn Monroe's iconic oh. dresses or the wooden panel that Kate Winslet and Leonardo I DiCaprio cling to at the end of the movie Eddie. Titanic. Is there anyone alive out there? True. Not every item on sale has a stratospheric starting bid, but you likely shell out more than $30,000 for Moses Fiberglass staff. And bidding for the custom Harley motorcycle Bruce Willis drove in Pulp Fiction, that starts at around $20,000. Whose motorcycle is this? It's a chopper, babe. Whose chopper is this? He's dead. Show me the screen. He's dead, baby.
stories. <laughs> You're listening to All Things Considered. From Not sure how to travel. The governor of Florida is deploying troops in case there's an influx of migrants from Haiti. Details are next on All Things Considered after KQED traffic starting in Oakland. Here's Julie Deppish. And that's an SUV that ran out of gas on South 880, 16th of Arcadero. Two left lanes are blocked, so heavy back up to Fifth Street. Then a motorcycle crashed out in Fremont, South 880, Dakota Road. Also a car involved. They're in the middle lane, and backing up to Alvarado Boulevard. And a solo spin out in Sunnyvale, South 101, before the 237 interchange. Center divide, but slow from Highway 85. Police reported ahead. Estimated time in traffic, 17 minutes. Hopefully, no traffic or heavy 
intercepted at sea at the naval station in Guantanamo, Cuba. Seeking asylum or refugee status is not something that is criminal, it's legal. And treating people like criminals with these kinds of detention policies, be they in Guantanamo or elsewhere, are perfectly unacceptable. Even DeSantis acknowledges that a wave of migrants in boats may not materialize. In recent years, vastly more Haitians have come to the U.S. over the southern border than by making the hazardous boat crossing to Florida. Greg Allen, and if you're in the Miami. The inventor of the world's first karaoke machine has died in Japan. Today, G Magazine was 100 years old. His 1967 invention did not make him rich or famous, but his empire's Chloe Bellman reports it's had a lasting impact. The world's first karaoke machine was a bulky cube shaped box made up of an eight track tape deck, amplifier, and mic. There were cartridges loaded with backing tracks to well known songs, a booklet printed with lyrics, and also just for a little bit of decoration, this brand new box gets the name. It has a series of flashing disco lights in the front that strove in time with the music. Long-time Tokyo based author Matt Holt first got to know the inventor of the Sparkle Box, Shigeichi Negishi, in 2018 while researching his book, Your Invention, How Japan Made the Modern World. They became friends. Holt says Negishi once demoed one of the last remaining Sparkle Boxes for him. It's a little bit, you know, wonky, but it still works. There's footage of this machine in action online. She sold around 8,000 Sparco boxes to bars, clubs, and hotels. But the business floundered. Alp says by the mid 1970s, the entrepreneur, who never patented his invention, got out. But it proved profoundly transformative because until this point, there was no way for an amateur to hear their voice even coming through a speaker, let alone. In time with music. Born in Tokyo in 1923, Negishi studied economics in college. He sold cameras before launching a consumer electronics company in the mid 1950s. He was also a lifelong arts lover who had a passion for basket weaving and vocal music. Alt says Negishi came on the scene in post war Japan when singing was a popular social activity, especially among white collar workers. They unwound by singing themselves after a couple rounds of beers to the accompaniment of a wandering musician known as a nagashi who plied the streets of japan nagashi? selling songs to people who wanted to sing along yasujiro ozu's 1953 movie masterpiece tokyo story has a scene oh, in which nagashi Japanese musicians song. play guitar and accordion <laughs> Surprisingly, given the importance of singing in Japanese culture at that time, Japanese others besides Shigeichi Negashi also came up with karaoke systems. The most famous of them is Daisuke Inoue. He invented a machine in 1971 that was easier for amateurs to sing with. Writer Matt Alt says Inoue certainly deserves credit for popularizing karaoke. But he's not the first one to invent a machine. That's Mr. Negashi. On a recent night at the Legionnaire Saloon, a karaoke hotspot in Oakland, California, songs like this pop favorite got the entire room yes, singing and dancing. This is right now, the Gina Yao is a regular, really into karaoke. The 29-year-old Oakland resident yes. says she read about the death of Shigeichi Negashi That house in an Francisco. I'm like, oh my god, like, this yeah, dude created it, true. and now here we are, like, living this out. Enjoy. It's such a great part That's of my house life, you know? Karaoke you take, technology yeah. has come a long way since the days of the Sparkle Box. But Yap says it's amazing Excellent. to see what a difference Excellent. this one invention has made to her and her community. Chloe Beltman, NPR News. Rainbow City. So I'm going to We know you're singing along. Thank you for listening to all things.
considered from NPR News. Support for NPR comes from Workday. With AI and core of the platform, Workday is committed to delivering continuous innovation to help teams stay agile. Workday, the finance and HR platform for a changing world. From Procter & Gamble, they post these low piercing gummies designed with melatonin for occasional sleeplessness to help people fall asleep naturally. Learn more at sequel.com. From Whitbox, with the goal of helping people discover a world of British TV, including new and series, Archie, the man who became Terry Grant, streaming at Whitbox.com slash NPR, and from the listeners of KQED. The Justice Department is suing Apple, accusing the company of abusing its power as a monopoly. That story is coming up next on All Things Considered after the newscast and after your KQED traffic update starting at Fremont. Here's Judy Dutch. It looks like all lanes are blocked now on South 880 Dakota Road. A car and motorcycle colliding. We're seeing big delays uh, well into Hayward. San Jose, a couple of cars colliding South 101 before Blossom Hill Road. That's in the right lane. Brake lines from Capitol Expressway. On Fairfield 80 westbound before Air Base Parkway. You've got a three vehicle entry rack. Third lane to the left is very slow. Back to Davis Street. Julie Deppish for KQED. Julie's next update is at 518. Support for KQED comes from American Conservatory Theater, presenting A Strange Loop, the Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award winner Michael R. Jackson's Great American Musical, starts April 18th. For tickets, visit act-sf.org. I'm Michelle Hennigan, and you're listening to KQED 88.5 San Francisco and KQEI 89.3. North Highland, Sacramento at 5 p.m. Sacramento. Sacramento. Consumers should not have to pay higher prices Sacramento. because companies break the law. In a Sacramento. sweeping new lawsuit, Sacramento. the federal government accuses Apple of creating a smartphone monopoly around really? the iPhone. For Thursday, March 21st, right, this on. is All Things Considered Just from center. NPR News. Next. And I'm Elsa Chang. Another notable lawsuit. The city of Chicago accuses Glock of making handguns that are too easy to convert into illegal automatic weapons. A decade ago, you may have seen four or five bullet cases. Now you're showing to a crime scene. You may see 40, 50, 60 shell cases. And the Congress awards the gold medal to men who have been called combat con artists. The soldiers behind the ghost army of World War II. They integrated all these techniques into a process that was highly believed. Plus, we remember the musician known as Hollow Boy. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Jack Spear. The Justice Department and more than a dozen states are suing Apple, alleging the tech giant violated antitrust laws by making it difficult for rivals to compete. As NPR's Bobby Allen explains, it's the latest aimed monopoly suit filed against Silicon Valley. Authorities say Apple has for years built an uneven playing field and protected it to become one of the world's richest companies. Prosecutors say when it comes to payments, messaging, and downloading apps on iPhones, Apple has used its power to block competitors and stifle competition in violation of antitrust laws. For customers, the suit argues this has meant fewer options for phones, apps and smartwatches, and higher prices. Apple has described the Justice Department suit as government overreach that would make Apple products less innovative and secure. Some of the laws at play here are 130 years old and were crafted to rein in robber barons in the steel and railroad industries. Bobby Allen, NPR News. Florida's well, governor says he's taking action to prepare for a possible surge in migrants coming by boat from Haiti. NPR's Greg Allen reports some Haitian American leaders say he's just playing politics. The Coast Guard says it hasn't seen any increase in the number of Haitians attempting the hazardous crossing by boat. But Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says to be ready, he's sending more than 250 officers and guard troops to help the Coast Guard intercept Haitian migrants. Democratic State Representative Dottie Joseph, a Haitian American, says the governor should work to help close the pipeline of guns from Florida going to the island. If he wanted to send law enforcement to do something productive, then he would work to make sure that they're helping train, not just at our port, but in a lot of the private places along the Miami River, where we know a lot of things are coming from. In recent years, many more Haitians have come to the U.S. over the southern border than by making the hazardous boat crossing to Florida. 
Greg Allen, NPR News, Miami. Sales of existing homes in February is, uh, rose by nearly 10% from the previous month. NPR's Chris Arnold tells us home prices are rising oh, again, too. A nationwide housing shortage has kept home prices resilient despite higher interest rates in recent years. Now the supply of homes is increasing, up 10% from a year ago, and that's helping to lift the number of home sales. Lawrence Yoon is the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist. That's good news for consumers. I would like to see even further, 50% growth in inventory over the next two years. They need to see more houses so that they can buy a home. But for now, there still are not enough homes to meet the pent-up demand, so prices are rising. The median home price hit an all-time high for the month of February at nearly $385,000. That's up 6% from a year ago. Chris Arnold, NPR News. Also going up the cost of borrowing to buy a home. Mortgage buyer Freddie Mac says the interest rate on the average 30-year loan rose 6.87% a year ago. It was at 6.42%. Wow. The dollar's up 300 points. This is NPR. Live from KQBD News, I'm Natalia Navarro. One of California's largest home insurers, State Farm, said that it will not renew 72,000 policies in the state. KQBD's Daniel Benton has more. This comes after the insurer stopped writing new homeowners policies in the state last year and raised rates by an average of 20% for remaining customers. The cuts represent about 2% of its total policies in the state. They include all commercial apartment policies, as well as some homeowners, rentals, and other policies. State Farm says the cuts are to ensure long-term sustainability and are prompted by inflation and natural disasters such as wildfires. California is proposing major changes to insurance regulations in an effort to stabilize the market and stop companies from leaving. Customers affected by the cuts will be notified this summer. I'm Danielle Benton, KQED News. Following a fatal West Portal crash that killed a family of four, the neighborhood city supervisor Myrna Melgar says she wants to make some changes. That intersection is dangerous. So, because we know there's a lot of people on the sidewalk and on the street, I would like some physical improvements to make things safer. For a start, no bar things like concrete and metal wallers added Can't to bus go. stops at busy intersections, Traffic. like the site of the crash. Nalgar plans to submit a resolution outlining her proposed changes to the Board of Supervisors on Tuesday. Meanwhile, one, Nalgar says one, three counselors one. with the city's Department of Public Health have been deployed to the neighborhood to help residents process their grief. Go, go, I'm Natalia Navarro, KQED News. Support comes from OAK with new nonstop service to Minneapolis on Sun Country. iFlyOAK.com. Support for NPR comes from the Kaufman This is traffic today. This is right now. And support for KQED comes from Picture House, presenting the new film, Carol Dota, Crossing at the Condor, the story of a daring woman who ignited the flames of the 1960s sexual revolution and became an international icon. Opens Friday, only in theaters. I thought, you know, everyone... This is All Things Considered from NPR News. I'm Nelson Chang in Culver City, California. And I'm Ari Shapiro in Washington. Here in the United States, one in every seven people owns an Apple iPhone. It is easily one of the most popular gadgets of our time. And today, the Justice Department filed a blockbuster lawsuit accusing Apple of acting illegally to get that dominance. NPR tech correspondent Dara Kerr is covering this case. Hi, Dara. Hey. What does the Justice Department accuse Apple of doing? It's hard to overstate how headline-grabbing this case is. The Justice Department, along with 16 states and AGs, are saying Apple has illegally used monopoly power to edge out competitors when it comes to the iPhone. This is how Attorney General Merrick Garland spelled it out. We allege that Apple has consolidated its monopoly power, not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. Garland went on to say Apple is illegally dominating the smartphone market. He says it's vital to innovation and threatens the free and fair market system. And this leads to increased costs for consumers. Just think of the price of an iPhone. The new ones are upwards of $1,000. That's a lot of money considering they have three quarters of the market. The government says Apple's flex 
flexes its muscle by making it nearly impossible for third-party developers to create apps and products across platforms. And it says that creates a crummy experience for people who want to use things like iMessage or Apple Pay, because only Apple can do that. Well, apart from the green color of the text message bubble when I message somebody who doesn't use an iPhone, can you give us an example of a kind of crummy experience the laws you talked about?
experienced radio operators can often identify each other by their so-called fist. Their style of hitting... Estimated time in traffic, seven minutes. Wow. 
Estimated time in traffic, nine minutes.
plenty of TV ads and people knocking on doors. Tamara Keith, NPR News. A new Indiana law allows universities to revoke a professor's tenure if they don't promote what the law calls intellectual diversity in the classroom. Supporters of the measure say they want to make universities more accepting of conservative students and academics. Many professors say the law can put their careers in jeopardy for what they say or don't say in the classroom. Ethan Sandwise from every station WFIU reports. Tenure is supposed to mean indefinite employment for professors, where they can only be fired for cause or some extraordinary circumstance. But under Indiana's new law, a university's board of trustees can deny a professor tenure if they determine a candidate is, quote, unlikely to foster a culture of intellectual diversity. I wouldn't mince words. I'd say it ends tenure in the state of Indiana, as we know. That's Ben Robinson, an associate professor of Germanic Studies at Indiana University. He says he's worried that political appointees will interfere with tenure, which normally is handled by university departments. The law also creates a system where students and staff can submit complaints that could be considered in tenure reviews. Robinson says that'll make it harder to recruit professors to the state. If you're an academic, knowing that you'll be subject to review by a politically appointed legislature every five years, and in fact, the initial grant of tenure will be subject to such review, you will not choose to come to the state of Indiana. But that's not how supporters see it. The law's author is Republican State Senator Spencer Deary, a former chief of staff for the president of Purdue University. He says the new law would help conservative students feel more comfortable Seven. expressing their opinions on campus. The American public and Hoosiers as well are losing faith and trust in higher education. And one of the strong reasons for that is, frankly, that higher ed hasn't done a great job of making every viewpoint feel welcome. IU's president criticized the bill, saying it would weaken intellectual rigor at the university. But Purdue University's president says the bill wouldn't change much, expressing doubt the trustees would take a heavy-handed approach. Deary argues that the law doesn't end tenure, but instead strengthens it. Anybody who favors and understands the reasons why we have tenure should be supportive of that and celebrate that change. The law does include some protections for faculty. It prevents trustees from disciplining professors for criticizing the university or engaging in public commentary. But academics say these protections are already implicit in tenure. This is a big deal. This is a national thing, and I've read the bill, and it's absolutely chilling. Irene Mulvey is president of the American Association of University Ooh, Professors, an organization that advocates for the academic freedom and job security of educators. Indiana is the third state to pass a law redefining tenure in recent years. We are seeing the brain drain that we predicted in Texas and Florida, and I think Indiana will follow suit there. I'd like to say just one very short thing. The bill triggered protests on several Indiana campuses. Here's IU undergraduate student Elena Ledesma. Freedom of speech is embedded in university and this is just undermining it to the greatest degree it can. IU professor emeritus Russ Skiba says he worries what the new law would mean for discussions on race, gender, and other sensitive topics. There are a lot of people in this state that believe we need to keep moving forward towards diversity, towards justice, towards fairness. And it's time that the legislature understood that. Republican Governor Eric Holcomb signed a bill last week. In a statement, he said he believes universities will, quote, faithfully implement this law. Meanwhile, there are still details that need to be resolved, like how will a handful of trustees at each university handle the reviews of thousands of professors every five years. For NPR News, I'm Ethan Sandwise in Bloomington, Indiana. starts with trouble at Alamo. Here's Julie Devish. And looking at southbound 680 before a Stone Valley Road, an SUV and a pickup truck got into it. At least the left lane blocked. It's very slow into Walnut Creek. Trying to clear a stall in San Jose, northbound 280 before Ray Street. It's in the uh, second lane for the left. Back to that motorcycle crash, Fremont, south oh. 880 Dakota Road. The uh, left lanes are blocked. You're getting by the far right lane really jammed, though, out of Hayward. Julie Deppich for KQED. Support for KQED comes from Live Nation. Presenting Terrible the KQED traffic, traffic at Dallas with Fine Arts on March 24th. Tickets available Friday at LiveNation.com and from San Francisco State University's Clinical Medical Assistant Program, which prepares students for certification in as little as three months. Visit cpage.sfsu.edu slash KQED. It's 5.30. It's KQED News. I'm Natalia Navarro. The
Year Rwanda Center for the Arts has reopened its doors with new leadership amid controversy over protests about the Israel-Hamas war. KQBD arts reporter Nastia Voynovskaya filed this story for NPR's Morning Edition. Last Friday, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts opened its doors for the first time in a month since the February 15th protest where eight artists modified their own exhibited works with pro-Palestinian messages. Protesters also demanded the museum join a boycott of Israeli academic and cultural institutions and to, quote, remove all Zionist board members and funders. The protesters call themselves Bay Area Artists Against Genocide. Some 300 supporters joined them outside the museum on the eve of its reopening. Here's video artist Courtney Desiree Morris. All people have the right to a dignified existence, and all people have the right to sweetness and pleasure and happiness and joy. And I want that for Palestinians right now because they are suffering tremendously. The artist says the original protest was motivated by the museum's alleged censorship of pro-Palestinian art. Months prior, the art center prevented artist Lucasa Bronfman Verissimo from putting the words Free Palestine on a museum marquee above their mural. And painter Jeff Chung says he was told to change his mural that used the colors of the Palestinian flag. Bronfman Verissimo says the artist felt it was time to speak out. This is a moment in which artists locally in the Bay Area, nationally, must fight political oppression within the art world. After the protest, the museum closed for a month, prompting further censorship accusations. It sparked calls for a boycott and an open letter from staff criticizing leadership, which has now garnered nearly a thousand signatures from artists and museum goers. The city's board of supervisors now plans a public hearing on the controversy. The museum uses public funds and sits on city property. Similar protests have unfolded across the world, from the Hamburger Bahnhof Museum in Berlin, to the Brooklyn Museum, the Pace Gallery in New York, and many others. At New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, staffers are demanding the director call for a ceasefire and help protect Gaza's cultural heritage sites. I think what's happening is there is a waking up uh, of a lot of artists and cultural workers. That's Carol Bernadian, editor-in-chief of art publication Hyperallergic which has been covering the turmoil. During the last 40 years, the super wealthy have taken over super many of the art institutions that we yeah, often consider public, and in reality or not. Here in San Francisco, Yerba Buena officials called the artist's demands yeah, divisive and equal, a charge the artist denied. CEO Sarah Fensky Bahad initially told artists their modified works would be taken down, but then changed course. Fensky Bahad, who is Jewish, abruptly resigned on March 3rd as a result of the controversy. In her resignation letter, she wrote, quote, The vitriolic and anti-Semitic backlash directed at me personally since that night nearly three weeks ago has made being here intolerable. Your book went on board chair Renuka Kerr declined multiple requests for an interview, but said in an email statement that the museum is committed to rebuilding public trust. The situation and others like it have illuminated a divide, often with artists and museum workers on one side and museum leaders and funders on the other. And with no end in sight to Israel's military offensive in Gaza, questions remain about how artists and cultural institutions respond. Here's hyperallergic editor Bernatian. When an artist is being told that they can't include something with their work, when they can't alter their own work, then the question is, well, who owns that work? Who is allowed to determine how that work is seen and altered? He says those questions cut to the heart of freedom of expression. That was KQED arts reporter Nasia Voynovskaya, and I'm Natalia Navarro, KQED News. Support comes from European School Works in Berkeley, where research through the design helps feel sustainable land discomfort. Learn more at supportworks.com. Support for KQED comes from SF MoMA. It's the last chance to see a boy who saw us in the first Northern California Soul Exhibition of Cold War Love, where visitors can experience. In 4.9 miles, take exit 409, Whipple Avenue. And from visitorscoverage.com, offering both inbound U.S. and outbound U.S. travel medical and trip insurance, so travelers are covered for financial risks or medical emergency wherever they go. Learn more at visitorscoverage.com. It will be cloudy tonight with lows in the 50s, rainy tomorrow and Saturday with highs in the 60s. And support for and Yahoo follows from Indeed, designed to be an end to entire solution for businesses of all sizes to attract.
Leonard from NPR News. I'm Ari Shapiro in Washington. And I'm Elsa Chang in Culver City, California. This week, the city of Chicago filed a lawsuit against Glock, the firearms manufacturer. The lawsuit accuses the company of making handguns that are too easy to convert into illegal automatic weapons. It's an unusual lawsuit. You want to tell us more about it? It's a pure law enforcement correspondent, Mark Costey. Yes. Okay, so can you explain more about what this lawsuit is saying about Glock guns? Like, how are they being modified? Well, what people are doing are adding these little objects, these little devices called auto seers. Sometimes they're called clock switches. These are small little boxy things. Some people say they look like Lego bricks. Um, some people have 3D printed them at home or bought them on the inter internet somewhere. But when you insert one of these into the back end of the handgun, it changes the way the gun fires. Instead of one shot per trigger pull, which is a semi-automatic, you get one trigger pull, pull producing a spray of bullets. Essentially, you get a handheld machine gun. And the thing about the Glock is that their design is especially easy to modify this way. It's the most common by far brand of gun this happens to. And why Chicago is the point of here? Like, why is the city so common? Well, police around the country have told me that these box switches are becoming more popular, especially with young men and teenagers. They say the shootings that they've been investigating are more often very indiscriminate. But this phenomenon appears to be especially Four, intense one, in Chicago. The police there say that in the last two years they've recovered more than 1,100 of these modified locks from crime scenes. Uh, I talked to Gary Gatewood. He's the city's deputy mayor for community safety. Law enforcement is showing up to crime scenes where a decade ago you may have seen four or five bullet cases. Now you're showing up to a crime scene you may have seen 40, 50, 60 shell cases. We are the number one city in the country for mass shootings. And I should note that what he means by mass shooting is as it's defined as uh, four or more people who are injured or killed, not including the shooter. That's the metric used by the Gun Violence Archive, and they counted 35 shootings like that in Chicago last year. Well, what has Glock said so far about this lawsuit? Well, the company didn't respond to our request for comment, but I did talk to Mark Oliver. In one mile, use the right two lanes to take exit 409 Whipple Avenue. And he's been talking to Glock, and he says the company is the wrong target here. Supposed Glock switches are not a Glock product. It is an illegal product that people are illegally attaching to their firearms. So they're criminally misusing a banned product and attaching it to a firearm to use for criminal misuse. He says also that the White House did approach the company asking it to consider changing the design, but they're resisting that, he says. The argument is that changing what's known as a very reliable gun design might make it less reliable, especially if the firing mechanism has changed. So that's their position. Can I say this? It, it feels like makers of firearms have been facing more lawsuits like in the past couple of years. Is Chicago's lawsuit part of some new strategy against the gun industry? It, it seems to be. Um, the background here is that the gun makers are protected by a federal law passed in 20, 2005 that shields them from lawsuits, but it's not an absolute protection, not all lawsuits. There are some loopholes for things like, like, for example, when a gun is considered a nuisance. That's something this Chicago lawsuit claims about the easy to convert Glocks. Um, some Democratic run states have also recently. Exit right to exit 409, Whipple Avenue. In one mile, turn right on Maple Street. Yesterday it came this way.
in 700 feet. Turn left on Spring Street. Turn left on Spring Street. My show. This is not Spring Street. This is my show. Main Street. This is up over there. In 800 feet, turn right on Maple Street, then turn left. Turn right on Maple Street, then turn left on Spring Street. Turn left on Spring Street. You've arrived. Destination is on your right. 